I am Courtney. I am the resident crazy chicken lady on Living Peace Farm. Um, and today we're talking about keeping your own chickens and why you should keep your own chickens. Why we keep chickens on Living Peace Farm, we've kept chickens almost as long as I can remember that we've been living on a farm. We've always kept the Potterstrom Cookbook, very, very nice breed, and they are indigenous to South Africa, which is quite cool as well. Um, we started, well, my dad started living seeds with the goal of keeping alien seeds from dying out and being lost. With chickens, our goal is kind of the same thing. There are a number of chicken breeds worldwide that are either on their way to endangered or currently endangered. We keep a few of those. Um, unfortunately, a couple of them are not yet for sale. We're still working on growing up a few extra so that we have a few more hens. Um, but it's very important to us that we help keep old chicken breeds alive because they were bred for a reason. They have very cool and very unique attributes to them. For example, we have the white faced Spanish black. Very unique looking chicken. Some call it very incredible, some call it ugly. It depends on how you want to look at it. It has a white face and a huge white yellow that comes down. So on most chickens, the yellow is red. On this, it is pure white, very, very pretty. It's the oldest Mediterranean breed of chicken. And they are currently endangered, critically endangered, which means that there's less than 2,000 birds worldwide that have been reported. Um, so they are one of our project breeds that we're moving towards having them for sale so that you can help keep endangered birds alive. We also keep some very fun birds, Easter eggers and olive eggers. They are the only two hybrid birds that we keep and we only keep them for the egg colors that they give. Most of our other breeds are either on their way to endangered or heritage production birds. So your white Lagoon, your Rhode Island Red and your black Ostrich would be the three that you would look at if you want very high egg production. Um, they range between 280 to 300 eggs per year. So we keep those, very nice to have. You just have a couple of one of those breeds and they will keep you enough eggs to have a couple more unique breeds that might lay a little less. As you can see, we keep a range of egg colors from a very dark brown to greens and blues. These guys are a pinkish tint. I don't know if you guys can see it super well, but they Tints of kind of pink, which is quite pretty, bright white, and then our tiny little bantam eggs. Um, so bantam eggs, some people say that they are the best tasting boiled eggs. Um, they are very small. Most bantams you're looking at between 100 to 150 eggs a year, and they're quite small. Then we also keep the Indian runner duck. They are the only waterfowl that we keep. We keep them predominantly for pest control. We'll run them through our tunnels and they will get rid of any unwanted hookers before we plant out our seedlings. They lay between 300 and 350 eggs a year. And as you can see, the white lagoon is our largest egg layer. Egg size, the ducks are quite good. So that is why we keep chickens here. They also give you free compost slash fertilizer. We take all of our bedding from the chickens and put them into our worm farm, which then goes towards making germination mix and being put into our garden as well. Egg prices are crazy. I was not aware how crazy egg prices were because I'm lucky enough to not have to go and buy eggs. Um, but you can keep between four to six hens for under a hundred rand a month, and each hen will give you an egg every day to second day making it more than worth your while to rather keep chickens than buy your own eggs from the store. And your eggs will taste nicer, so that is an added benefit. A lot of people think that keeping chickens is very complicated. It's not. They need four things as a need. They need shelter, so a place where they feel safe to go and roost at night, and a place where they'll, make, they'll lay the eggs. They prefer a darker environment, help them feel safer. Generally, if I'm collecting eggs and I'll open the nesting box onto a hen laying, she'll pause and look at me until the egg box closes again. She doesn't like the life because it makes her feel unsafe and nervous about it. And obviously when you're laying eggs, you're in a little bit more of a vulnerable position, predator-wise. Um, 
they also need food. We would recommend always having layer pellets available to your birds. The layer pellets are specifically formulated to have the correct nutrients for them to lay eggs. They need a specific amount of calcium, they need a specific amount of protein. They will pick that up on their own if you are feeding them kitchen scraps, if you're feeding them greens, but it might not be quite enough. The cool and scary thing about chickens is if they don't have enough calcium coming through their feed to lay eggs, they'll actually start drawing calcium from their bones, um, which then weakens your chickens, you'll end up losing your birds. So feeding them a layer feed is definitely a recommendation. We will feed them any flowering lettuce, mustard, cabbages. We, over winter, we pretty much our radish patch is basically just for the chickens and they will eat those in its entirety. Some breeds don't like the roots, some breeds love them, and you'll just see and you'll just remove what they don't eat after a couple of days. That helps us keep our feed costs down regarding additives. You can feed them your kitchen scraps. So if you have a compost bowl, chickens will eat meat, they will eat eggshells, they will eat pretty much anything that comes through. There are a couple of things that chickens shouldn't get, uh, dried beans in any form, even if they're cooked, contain too much of a toxin that is bad for the chickens. I don't know what the toxin is called, uh, but it will kill your chickens. They cannot have chocolate at all. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I know some, some people will feed their chickens treats, and chocolate is excellent for us. I will have chocolate any day of the week. Chickens will not appreciate it. Even a small amount of chocolate can hurt um, your chicken. Avocado skin and pips are bad. Um, obviously, I'm assuming that avocados are expensive enough for most people to not want to feed them the flesh, but the skin and the pips can be toxic to them. Most of the time, chickens are quite good at knowing what they can and cannot have. If you let them loose into your garden, they will avoid the plants that they know are bad for them. So, tomato plants. They cannot eat plants. They can eat the fruit, not the plants. And you won't find your chickens going, ooh, tomato plants, my favorite. They will avoid them and eat bugs generally. Most chickens will also snack on a few of your veggies. Um, generally speaking, they'll avoid it. If kitchen scraps is one of their main food sources and they are hungry, they will eat things that are not good for them. Um, so I would just be aware of that and try to avoid that when possible. Green beans and the bean plants are fine. It's only once the beans have dried. Cool. Then they need water constantly. The hotter it is, the more water they'll go through. Chickens are quite good at regulating their body temperatures. Most of the time, people think that winter is the time that you have to worry about them getting too cold. They are fine in winter. They don't need any extra heating. They don't need any of that. They fluff up their down feathers and they'll keep themselves warm. Summer, they have a little bit more of a problem. If you're noticing that your chickens are standing around with their mouths open, breathing super heavily, they kind of lift their wings up, that's, they're too hot. You can put down a little pool of water, only about so big. The chickens can swim, but sometimes chickens are not very smart. Um, so just about so big, and they'll kind of keep their feet in the water and that'll help cool them down. People also freeze fruits and things like that in ice for them, and that's a wonderful way to give them an extra treat of fruit or whatever's frozen. Some people will freeze bugs if you want to put that in your freezer. Um, but we we don't really give them any extras, and they do the summer fine. The only extra we'll be doing the summer is adding a little extra shade cloth above um, them, just giving them a slight bit of shade but we haven't found any adverse effects to not having additional water sources for them. And that's perfect. Chickens clean themselves. They clean themselves in the dust. So when you see a chicken rubbing itself into the dirt and fluffing up their feathers, they're cleaning out their feathers with the sand. Dust baths are one of the best ways to keep mites out of your flock. Mites can be a huge issue. Once you have a problem, you'll have a problem until you put in the efforts and actually get rid of them. If you put wood ash, and it has to be wood ash, it cannot be charcoal or any other kind of ash, it has to be wood. You put wood ash in their dust box, or just dust the chickens themselves with wood ash, which we will only dust the chickens themselves if we see mice. 
Um, but if you put it in a box, they will just secrete themselves and the wood ash will help kill any mice that are on them. If you have a mice problem, there are ways to take care of it and I will cover that in a little bit. Those are the four main things that chickens need. That's about it. You don't have to have <clears throat> a huge run like we do. Some of our runs have very few birds in, others have slightly more. How we keep our birds is considered free ranging. Free ranging is if the birds have any access to the outdoors. We give our birds greens every second day, plus minus, and then we'll give them just treats of seeds. Um, so we'll give them linseed, we'll give them sunflower seed, wheat, radish, the variety of different seeds that chickens can have. Those you'll give them a handful or two per cage. You don't want to give them any more than they can eat within a 15 minute period. You will make your chickens fat if you feed them too much. Um, so that's how we manage the free ranging experience. Obviously, we'd love to have them going through a field. That's called pasture raised, that is not free ranging. Unfortunately, we have a serval cast in the area, we have plenty of wild birds mongoose and jackal running around so for the safety of our birds they are completely pending. Wild birds will be your biggest um, disease vector. They will give it to your birds through their food, through their water, anything that their saliva touches and they can also be transmitted through the droppings which is why our pens are fully enclosed. If a wild bird does get in it's caught and removed immediately. Chickens will also eat a wild bird if it gets inside. They are cannibals. Um, so they will eat it if it gets inside. If the, if the bird is diseased, you don't want your chickens to do that. So that is one of the reasons why our pens are fully enclosed. You don't have to keep them enclosed. You do just run the risk of having more disease or pest issues. Wild birds will also be your carrier for months. Um, so you don't have to have as much space. If you've walked around the back, you would have seen little tractors. They're about so long. Um, and we can run between four and six hens in there. If a rooster is with them, you want to cut your hens down in half. Uh, because the rooster is so much bigger, he takes up a lot more space, especially when he does his little mating dance and mates them. Um, he needs a little bit more space, so you want to kind of cut your hens in half for that. But in that system, that is a free-ranging system, we'll move on to fresh grass every day or two, depending on how many birds are inside there. That system can take four to six birds under 100 rand a month with their seeds and everything included. So that is a very nice way, if you don't have a lot of space, that you can keep your own chickens, get your fresh eggs, um, and still get your grass or your lawn fertilized. Some people, which is very smart, will make their garden beds, their pathway slightly wider so that the tractors can actually run down the pathway so that your garden is benefiting as well. And then chickens will eat any pests that come through their pen. So if you wanted to slightly adjust your garden for something like that to put through, that's one of the best options to have chickens doing pest control in your garden without having them free range and snack on whatever they see. The nice thing about um, bantams is that they will do very minimal damage to your plants and will mostly do pest control. So they are so much smaller. We have two bantams that have feathered feet. We have the silky and the bobby duplace. They, uh, with the feathered feet, they'll do less damage with scratching and walking. They're much more aware of where they put their feet due to the feathers. The other birds, the Polish and the zebra, they don't have feathered feet, but because they're so small, they won't do quite as much damage to your plants. They'll still eat them if they fancy it, but generally speaking, birds that are in your garden will rather go for bugs of some sort. Indian runner ducks would be our top recommendation if you want birds rearranging in your garden full time. They have incredible senses of smell to root out worms and slugs and snails and all sorts of beetles and they will generally leave your plants alone. They are much more interested in the bugs. The only time that Indian run ducks can be a bit of a problem is when you have seedlings just planted out. Because the seedlings are so small, they are very tasty snacks to the ducks. We found that our ducks tend to like lettuce seedlings more than any others. So whenever we have lettuce seedlings, the ducks get pinned up. 
but every now and then we'll let them go through the garden. But generally we'll run them through our tunnel and we'll run them through our tunnel for about two to three weeks before we plant our seedlings. Um, and that will deal with the cutting problem as well. If you want to have larger birds and you want them to run through your garden, an hour before sunset, let them out. As the sun goes down, they will go home on their own. Chickens are blind at night. They cannot see a thing. They want to be somewhere where they know that they're safe and they will make their way into their um, roost on their own. So an hour before sunset, it's a very small window of time for them to be damaged for your plants. They will um, do your pest control for you and then they'll go home happy as can be. So that, if you have larger birds and you want to run them through without letting them free range, that would be the recommendation for that. If you have very few hens, the damage that they do won't be too bad. If you have a flock of 10 plus, they can decimate a garden in a couple of days. So depending on the breed, bush folders are probably the worst for that. They will decimate a garden and say thank you very much and go off about their day. Um, okay, treats-wise, you can feed them mealworms. The only thing about mealworms is that we, I would recommend that they are dead. They can actually burrow back through the chicken's throat and kill your birds. So I would just recommend that you make sure that they are not live. Because sometimes a chicken won't chew it and kill it, so they'll just, oh, thanks, swallow, and there's a little live mealworm in their throat, which is not what you want for your birds. If you want to feed them treats, you don't want the treats to eat them back. Okay, so keeping chickens in town. Generally speaking, the city of Johannesburg allows you to keep 10 chickens. They specifically use the wording chickens, which means it could be hens and roosters. I know in the case, they specifically say five hens. If you want a rooster, you have to apply for a permit for a rooster. Whereas Joburg, they just say ten chickens. As long as they're not a noise nuisance to your neighbours. If your neighbours complain, you might have some issues. Generally speaking, neighbours can be bribed off with a couple of fresh farming. Um, and they will generally be happy with a couple every now and then as soon as you know your rooster starts grating on a few people's nerves at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but if you just want to keep chickens, you can keep 10 chickens in your backyard. I think the recommendations are they can't be against your house and they can't be against your neighbouring wall. They kind of need to be away from both of those and they need to have a certain amount of space and they can't be taller than a certain height. It varies and I would um, definitely recommend checking your specific municipality bylaws for that. Um, but you can keep chickens in town. You don't have to have a lot of space there. You can keep them in the little tractor. You can build your own little coop for them. As long as they're not against the wall or your house, you're fine. They do say that no chickens are supposed to be allowed in your house. I don't think that they check on that if you wanted to have chickens that are that much of a pest. Which chickens actually do make one of the best pests out there. They can remember up to 100 human faces and they can remember sounds that you say to them. So if every time you say a certain thing and you open the pen and give them feed, when they hear you say that, they know that food is coming. I will always say hello and as I'm collecting eggs, I'll talk to the birds so that they know who I am, they know my voice. Some of them don't appreciate it very much when they're broody. Most of the time, even if they're broody, as soon as they recognize that it's me, they tend to calm down a little bit. We've had, when I'm training people to collect eggs and we've had a broody hen, They'll try to collect and get bitten. I will go in and talk to them, and I will not get bitten. So chickens do remember you. They remember your faces. They remember your voice. Um, they have their little relationships within their flock, and they remember each other, and they talk to each other um, with different sorts of clucking. So if you hear a rooster um, telling the hens that there's a treat, it's a very different sound that you'll make throughout the rest of the day, uh, which is quite cool. They're also incredibly friendly. We have a lot of breeds that you can pick up for a cuddle and they are absolutely fine with it. One of those would be the Buck Orpington. Lovely breed, super fluffy. And you can pick them up, totally fine. As soon as you start like moving them around a bunch, they kind of go, what are you doing? But generally speaking, you can hold them, you can pet them, and they're fine. 
The displays and the sorties, also incredibly friendly. The displays, if you raise them up and you get to know them, they will actually sit on your shoulder and take a walk around with you. They'll hop up onto your lap. So chickens can be more than just a farm animal. They can definitely be more of a pet, and you can form your little relationships with them as they go. Another cool thing about chickens is each hen will always lay one color of egg. So for example, we have our Easter eggers. So all four of these eggs are Easter egg eggs. We've got one speckled, so that's a little more green. We have one that's a nice blue. We have this one that is a little more gray with green underneath. And this one that's a little green. I know that a different hen laid each of these eggs because they all are different colors. They're also all a slightly different shape. With our Easter eggers, they're the only breed that we cannot guarantee an egg color once uh, before they've started laying. So if we sell you an Easter egg chick or egg for hatching, we cannot guarantee the color that they'll lay. They could lay anywhere from green to blue to pink to, to brown. We cannot guarantee it. But once they lay that one color, they will only lay that one color for the rest of their lives. Their color darkness might change very slightly. We like to say that they run out of ink as they go. Our black copper marines are a great example of that. This is not the darkest egg we've ever had. You want to go about two to three times as dark as this. And that's the color that they'll start the season kind of laying. As the season goes, they'll get lighter and lighter and lighter. They'll molt over winter. And when they come back in spring, their eggs will be dark again. As they get older, their egg color over the years will lighten every single year as they get older. That color will not affect the color that any chicks lay. It only matters what the hen started laying because those will be her genetics. Eggshells are either white or blue. Even, so technically, even the blue eggshells were once white. White eggshells are the general uh, color. The blue is dominant. So any white bird that's crossed with a blue layer will come out blue. It would be very light or a darker blue, but it will be blue. What happens is it's something in the bile that is applied to the eggshell so early on that the color actually goes straight through the shell. You'll notice when you crack a brown egg at home, the inside of the egg is still white. That's because the brown is a pigment that is applied over the eggshell through the process of laying, it doesn't go through. Whereas the blue is a pigment that's applied so early on that it goes straight through. So if I had to crack this egg, inside the shell would still be blue. The inside of the egg still looks like a normal egg. You won't get blue yolks or green yolks, they'll be orange. Uh, the black copper morans have a very, very dark amount um, of the brown pigment. They also apply it a little more thickly. So when we candle eggs, which is when you check in to see the fertility and the development of the eggs, with these eggs, they're much harder to see through because that color is a lot darker and it's a little bit thicker than on your normal eggshells. So that's quite cool about eggs. What you feed your chickens will not change the color of their shells at all. You can feed your chickens um, things to change the color of their yolks. Things like marigolds, fresh greens, things like that, will give you a much darker yolk, but they won't change anything else. They will obviously improve the taste. Um, free range or birds that are fed a more natural diet will always have better tasting eggs than the eggs that you're going to get into the, um, from the store. Duck eggs do have a different flavor than chicken eggs. A lot of people say that it's like eating a buttery chicken egg. In baking, they will give you fluffier cakes and moister breads, and they'll just make your baking so much better. So if you are an avid baker, I would say get some duck eggs. Chicken eggs will work fine. Duck eggs will just boost your flavors and your tastes and your textures just a little bit more, which is very nice. Any questions regarding keeping chicken? Okay, so the question is, if you have mice or rats in your coop, what can you do to get rid of it? 
some chickens will eat mice. Um, chickens will definitely do the work for you for mice. If the rats are very large, you can trap for them. Um, we have a very happy Jack Russell that runs around hunting rats um, and a lab that helps him do it. And we have farm cats around as well. So they tend to control our rodent problem on their own. We've never found um, an issue with any rodents getting into our large pens. We did have rodents against the wall um, and we let the birds out, let the dogs in, they caught the rats, let the dogs out, let the birds back in. And that's probably the easiest way that you're going to get rid of um, rodents without with, um, going to poisons and things like that, which obviously you don't want to do because your chickens will probably eat it as well. Anything else? Yes. So chickens can so it depends. Sorry, the question sorry, the question is how high does your fence need to be? Um, so chickens can get quite high off the ground. You want it to be a couple meters high. If there's anything that they can jump onto and jump over the fence you're probably going to want to have it fully enclosed. Um, if you're planning on having it fully enclosed anyway, you can have it quite low to the ground. Like our tractors, they're only about so tall. Um, and that's enough space for them. That will be fun. As long as they move on to fresh grass every day, that will be a good enough space for them. Our smaller birds, you'll see the pens against the tunnel have a much shorter, I think it's only about so high, whereas our larger birds are quite high up, and that's because our housing is much higher for them. They like to roost up. So it depends on the breed. Some breeds are better flyers than others. Some breeds are not great flyers at all. I would say you want to have it at least so, so high, whatever that measures. <laughs> Two meters. Yeah, rather higher than lower, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the question is, could ducks and chickens cohabit? Yes, they can. Ducks do have a much wetter environment than chickens do. So you would definitely want to have their own space um, so that they have the little water, their pond, um, however you're going to manage their need to get under water. A little separate, the chickens should be fine with it. Like I said, chickens can swim. The only chicken that you should be worried about is the silky. They will most likely not swim and will drown. Um, they also don't do very well with getting wet at all. Um, if it's cold and wet, you're going to need to blow dry your silkies. They, yeah. <laughs> which they do end up liking if it happens often enough. They look forward to their blow dry. Um, but yes, they can cohabit. I wouldn't recommend it with birds that have feathered feet because the moist environment of the ground won't do well for the feathers on their feet. But you can definitely make it work. I would also just make sure that they have space to go out and free range for a little bit during the day. So wing clipping is perfectly fine. It's not something that is um, very harmful to the bird. It's feathers that will grow back. It's not a huge problem. Um, if you want to have a shorter fence, wing clipping is definitely an option. Yeah. Um, the only clipping that we don't recommend is bee beaking. They need their beaks to be able to clean their feathers properly. Yes, they might damage an egg or peck at each other every now and then. They need their beak to go through their feathers and find the marks and the little lasts, and that will help them keep clean. Um, bee beaking is not a practice that we agree with, and it's something that you shouldn't be doing as a backyard chicken keeper at all for any reason. Cool. Yes? Um, yeah, so... If you don't wash them, normally you can just leave them on your counter or in your pantry for a couple of weeks. Don't leave them in the sun. 
you will have chicks developing in your eggs. Um, the, sun, the temperature of the sun will just raise the eggs to the perfect temperature for them to start developing. And that's about 37 degrees Celsius um, chicks will start developing in the eggs. So in the sun is a bad option. If you're refrigerating your eggs, washing them is not a crisis. Um, if you want them unwashed, refrigerating the eggs will still give you that month or so of keeping your eggs. There are other ways to store your eggs. Some people say in lime juice, some people say in water glasses. And that works for some people. I've never tried it and I don't know from experience. Uh, we tend to go through any eggs that are extra quite rapidly, so we've never had that problem. But we are a family of seven, so we'll go through quite a few eggs. If you want to store eggs long term, I would look into one of the egg storage methods and do your research on that. But because we don't do that, it's not something that I can comment on long term. On the counter, you're good for probably about three to four weeks. In the fridge, about the same, they'll just, if the difference will just be that they wash. Washing the eggs doesn't make them safer, things like that. What a lot of people will do is they'll have the eggs on the counter and then they'll just wash them right before they use them so that any extra bacteria is not going into the heat, especially if you crack your egg straight into the pan, I would recommend just washing the shell. You shouldn't get any weird diseases coming through your backyard chicken eggs. If your chickens are healthy, the eggs should be fine. Yes, sir. Okay, so if you have chickens, you do not have to have a rooster, only if you want chicks. The chickens will lay eggs without a rooster present. Um, if you want chicks, and if you have a lot of um, predatory, like mongoose, things like that, the rooster will be more protective. If you don't have a rooster, generally what will happen is you'll have a hen that steps up to that more dominant role, and she will become the flock protector. Yeah. For storing the eggs. Okay, so upside down. So this is the correct way to store the eggs. It's a rounder side up, pointy side down. Um, the air sac is on top, so especially if you're planning on incubating your eggs, this is the way you want it. For storage otherwise, I don't think it plays that much of a role in it because you're not planning to incubate it so that air sac staying um, in place is not as crucial. Giving your hen eggs to hatch and letting her hatch and then taking them away will help with the broodiness. There are other ways to break the broodiness of a hen if um, you don't want to breed. When they broody, they won't really lay eggs um, at all. You can, so some people say dunking their butts into cold water will um, help with that. It depends on how long they've been broody. The longer you leave it, the harder it is to break the broodiness. If they've just been broody for about a couple days just give them a dunk or move them to a pen that has open sides and bottoms they want that warmth of sitting on something if they have a cool like airflow coming up along them the whole time they won't stay broody so letting them hatch eggs and then giving the chicks back is a great option if you have someone that will accommodate that if you don't there's other ways to break the broodiness yes you have Yeah, so you can, so if you have a rooster fertilizing your eggs, you can still eat all of them. I would just make sure that you collect eggs on a daily basis. Any eggs that are sat on, um, if your hen does go broody, if she sits on eggs for more than a couple days, you run the risk of development starting. So I would make sure that you're collecting eggs daily. If you do want your hen to sit and hatch her own eggs, I would mark the eggs that you're leaving with her with just a permanent marker so that you know that those are her eggs. 
when other hens lay, she'll steal their eggs and try to fill them in as well. So I would just mark off the ones that you know you're leaving. You can still eat them, yeah, as long as they're... So we, most of the eggs that we'll eat has been fertilized. Um, we'll eat them because the rooster is um, not a breed that we want for that hen, or we just have a rooster that got bullied in the rooster pen and he got lucky and got put in with sick hens. Um, so we'll still eat those. There's no difference to the shelf life of the eggs at all. Yes, sir. So we, yeah, so what age is point of lay? We consider point of lay to be 18 weeks. That's when you'll sell birds at point of lay. That means you should expect them to start laying within the next month to two months, depending on the breed. Some breeds can take up to eight months to start laying. Some breeds will lay at five. So it just depends, but at 18 weeks, that's generally what's considered point of lay. Cool. So moving on to pests and diseases slash vaccinations. So if you're buying chicks from us or hens, roosters, whatever you want, they've all been vaccinated at day old for Newcastle and infectious bronchitis. The only vaccination that you're guaranteed to get from us with your birds. It's the one vaccination that we do recommend doing, Newcastle and bronchitis are two of the really bad diseases. Newcastle is notifiable. If you get Newcastle, you gotta notify the government and they gotta come through. And most likely they'll cull all of your birds. So we vaccinate for that. So if you're buying chicks for us, you're covered in that respect. We will also vaccinate for pariza. The very common chicken disease makes their faces swell. Um, not a great um, thing for your chickens to get. It's generally also, um, if not caught quickly, it can be fatal. Um, we vaccinate any birds from about eight weeks up. We'll vaccinate for Caraza. Currently, if you buy any birds in a 10 week old pen, they have not been vaccinated yet. They're waiting for our next round in about two weeks' time. Um, so we'll vaccinate for Caraza, but unless you're buying older birds, you're not guaranteed on this. It's not a vaccination that you have to do. Um, it's completely up to you. They sell it in a very large bottle. That doesn't make sense for a backyard chicken keeper to um, have. We also then vaccinate for fowl pox, which fowl pox is a, vac a vaccination that I would recommend that you do. Um, fowl pox is transmitted by both wild birds and mosquitoes. So it's chicken pox for chickens. Um, you'll get the little itchy warts um, that will grow on their combs, their wattles, and around their mouth. So if you see a little brown wart looking thing, it most likely is fowl pox. We find that we get the most issues with fowl pox from January onwards. Right after we had all those heavy rains, the mosquito population went through the roof and we got fowl pox come through. There's ways to control fowl pox. The dry version of fowl pox, which is just the little wart, is very mild. You won't generally have any birds that um, die from it. I think the mortality rate on it is 5% for, uh, for the dry version. If it develops into the wet version of fowl pox, which then it looks like little ulcers down their throat, they'll start rattling. That we have over a thousand birds. We had three birds that didn't make it with fowl pox, and all three of those were the ones that had wet pox. So those, you want to kind of avoid getting the wet pox as fast as possible. You can spray the environment with an antibacterial. We'll put an antibacterial through the um, water and an antiviral. And you can then put Vaseline and things like that on the actual uh, little warts. They're quite itchy and quite uncomfortable for chickens. So doing that just helps them be a little bit more calm. Obviously the more stressed out the chicken is, the higher the chance is that it won't make it. We will vaccinate for that. Um, if you would like to vaccinate for it, we're happy to walk you through. It's a little two-pronged needle that sticks through their wing webbing. Um, little pricks. The chickens will be fine. Um, and that will just keep them protected and we will do that vaccination here every January just to keep it through. Some people say you should do it September and January. We don't find a huge mosquito presence until January, February. And so that's why we do that thing. 
Any questions regarding vaccination? Yes, sir. Pardon? So for the Newcastle and infectious bronchitis, it's through their water. So that will just take the water away for an hour, put it back with the vaccine in, all checks will drink, and they're all good to go. Pariser, it's injected into their breast. And um, file pox, it's just a two-pronged needle that stabs through their wing webbing. Um, and that'll actually, you can go back, I think it's two to three weeks afterwards, and there should be a little scab that's formed right where you did that trick. If the scab has formed, the vaccination works. If there's no scab, you're probably going to need to vaccinate again. Cool. Then mice. Mice are probably going to be your biggest problem when it comes to keeping chickens. Um, generally speaking, chickens are easy. If you get mice, they're very difficult to get rid of unless you catch it early. So we would generally say if your chickens are friendly enough to hop on your lap, if they're on your lap, just check them for mice while you're holding them anyway. Mice are generally found around the vent and under the wing. If you just check those places, that's generally where the mice will be. It's their favorite places to hang out. And if there's mice there, you want to start a treatment immediately, we will do wood ash on the birds, clean out their entire pen, and then the fun thing about Biogrow is their pyrrole is safe for chickens. So we will spray the inside of the coop with pyrrole and we'll do that once a week until we stop seeing mice. Um, because our coops are fully enclosed, it doesn't have to be um, towards the evening uh, because they're not in sunlight. We would still recommend doing it towards the evening just because uh, you could still kill any beneficials because um, this will kill anything it comes into contact with. But we'll spray and we'll soak the coop in it because the mice will kind of hide inside the little stacks in the wood. So we'll make sure we soak the coop with that. And then when we put new shavings back in, we'll put wood ash or diatomaceous earth down, then the shavings down. So any mice that were on the ground will get that. And then their roots can also be dusted with wood ash or diatomaceous earth as well. If the chickens get sprayed with pyrrole, they will be fine. So pyrrole is toxic to um, fish, insects, and cats are a little sensitive to it as well. So if you have cats, I just keep them away from the coop for a couple of days. Um, and that's how we will generally take care of mice. You can also run ivermectin through their water, um, and ivermectin will also help with deworming of certain worms, but not all. So diatomaceous earth, um, I think you can get it at most co-ops. It's very, very finely crushed um, diatoms. Yeah. Um, so it's very, very finely crushed. It's, yeah, fossilized diatoms. Um, if you are running it through your coop, I would only recommend putting it on the bottom. If the chickens breathe in too much of it, it can be bad for their lungs which is why we put it underneath and why I'd rather dust the hens with wood ash and put wood ash into their dust bath. Um, wood ash won't have any adverse effects for your chickens. If it gets wet, it does go alkaline. So I would just be aware of that. And if they have a favorite dust bath area, I'd maybe just put a cover over it so that if it does rain, the wood ash doesn't get wet. But you can also just make them a little dust bath thing in cover. Um, so if you are adding wood ash to your dust bath, that's something that I would just be aware of. Any other questions regarding mic control? Yep. Cool. Deworming is the same thing. You, if you notice the presence of worms, you should deworm. We will deworm about every three months just to be safe. Obviously we have quite a lot of chickens. We also have other household animals and cows and things as well. So we'll just deworm every few months just to be on the safe side. Um, you would probably also want to be on the safe side. Certain worms can be put through the egg as well, uh, which is one of the ways that you can see if your chickens have worms is if you crack open an egg to a worm. Yeah. Uh, which is not something that you'd want to do. Perfect. I think that is everything that I have to share, unless everyone has questions that they would like answer to yes. Okay, so depending on the breed, sexing can be done at Dale, 
four weeks old, six weeks old, 10, 12, and then 18. It just depends on the breed. Some are incredibly hard to fix before 18 weeks. Certain breeds fix much sooner. So you'll get some breeds that are fixing, like the Scottish Rims for Cook. They have a white dot on the back of their heads, depending on the size of the dot, it's male or female. Um, some are auto sexing based on their patterning or pattern sexing. You can see whether they're male or female at uh, day old. So the Barnafelders is one of those. If their breast is white at day old, it's a male. If it's not, it's supposed to be a female. Um, so it just depends on the bird. White Lagoons show, the roosters show the combs at about four weeks old. So you can sex them at four weeks old and it'll be pretty accurate. Um, the hardest breeds to sex at the moment is our Rhode Island Reds. We have a lot of roosters that develop very slowly and we can only guarantee at 100% at 18 weeks whether or not it'll be male or female. So it just depends on the breed. Um, and every now and then you'll get a rooster that is non-dominant and he will develop a lot slower and will look like a female until he starts to crack. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. covering the roosters and putting them in the dark until you're ready to be woken up is definitely a good option. Yeah, it works for most roosters. Every now and then you'll get a stubborn one that will just crow throughout the night and he's just unhappy. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so that's also a good option if you do want to keep a rooster and you're in town and your neighbours are a little bit otherwise about you keeping um, roosters, you can put him in the dark and that will help um, keep him quiet. Catching him every day to put him in the dark is probably going to be your biggest problem. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, they don't. So I will always collect the eggs before we spray with Carol. So we collect eggs twice a day on the farm. Um, we'll collect in the morning and then late afternoon. So if we're planning to spray with Carol, I'll just push my egg collection back till right before we spray and just do a quick run through. Um, I don't know um, what if Carol affects the bloom of the egg at all. We haven't found that to be true. Um, but I would just rather just collect them out. It also means that um, if your shavings have all been removed, your chickens are laying eggs on a hard surface. And if anything cracks, your chickens will eat the eggs. So I just want to collect them anyway. Once chickens start eating eggs, getting them to stop is a little hard. Yeah. So we run our large incubator between 56 and 60. If it fluctuates slightly between those, it's not a big problem. Once we move to the hatch, the humidity stays above 60 the whole time. Yeah. The small ones should also um, run between about 55 and 60, and you should bump it slightly with the hatch. So, I think it depends on the chicken. So, I've done it with a couple, and some of them will stay, and others will like, okay. Oh, what are you doing? So I think it just depends on the chicken. If you want to run the experiment, I mean, it's always fun to try, but um, I don't know if it's something that works for every single bird. Yeah. Right. Yes. Uh, okay, so reasons for not having your chickens next to the house, mostly noise and um, dirt. I don't know why the uh, bylaws say that they can't be next to the house, um, but I'm assuming it's from a health and safety perspective um, because chickens will lose their feathers, they do create a little bit of dust, um, things like that. They can have worms, they can get mice, and you don't want any of those things moving into your house as well. Alright, is that everything? <laughs>